welcome to our uh, Oceans Alive lecture for this evening. And the last time I was in this auditorium and introduced our speaker was when she was about to defend her doctoral dissertation, which was just, oh, a, about a year and a half ago. So she survived that experience, and I know that she will provide great enjoyment for you this evening. Dr. Leila Saik is a graduate of University of Pennsylvania and a doctoral uh, PhD graduate of the MIT Hui Joint Program in Oceanography, specializing in biological oceanography. She is now an assistant professor at Massachusetts Maritime Academy, and her address this evening will be on communication in whales and dolphins. Layla? Thank you. And thank you. Okay. Thanks. OK, is this? Uh you can hear me? Is it on? <laughs> I can't really tell. <laughs> OK. OK, good. All right, well, I'm going to talk tonight about communication in whales and dolphins. I personally work on dolphins, one particular species, bottlenose dolphins. So I'm going to kind of get to that pretty early on in the talk and then focus in on talking about dolphin communication and some of my own work in particular. But I wanted to start out by giving some background on different species of cetaceans, which is just the sort of scientific term for whales and dolphins, and contrast, compare and contrast some of the differences in their life histories and how that relates to differences in their social structure and then also in their communication. So I'm just going to start out with the first first slide with um, just some real basic biology to orient you in, for those of you um, who may not be familiar with how marine mammals or cetaceans fit in taxonomically. Of course, they're animals, they're chordates, they're vertebrates, they have a backbone. They're mammals like us, which means they nurse their young and they have hair, even though you wouldn't think so about dolphins, but they do have very reduced um, hair follicles. So they are mammals like us and they breathe air. And then the next level down in the taxonomic hierarchy, if, if any of you are familiar with that, and if you aren't, you don't have to worry about it, but um, is the, their order, which is the scientific name cetacea. And that's where the common word that some of you may have heard, cetaceans, comes from. And then the next level down are two big groups of cetaceans, the mysticetes, or baleen whales, and the adonocetes, or toothed whales. And these are very, very different groups in many ways, and that's some of the things that I'm going to try to convey to you tonight. Um, the baleen whales, first off, don't have teeth. They have baleen, which are these plates of um, keratin material that they use to filter plankton, small organisms, or small fish out of the water. And the adonocetes are tooth whales. They have teeth, so they're active predators. They eat fish and squid. And I have, um, I guess the next slide just shows the breakdown of the species of mysticetes, the baleen whales. There are relatively few species of baleen whales. And probably most of them are ones that you've heard of. The first group up there are the bowhead, northern right, and southern right. The, the northern right is the most endangered species of baleen whales. There's only a few hundred of them left. And then some of the other groups, the gray whale populations are actually doing quite well right now. And then this last family, the humpbacks, are the most common groups that you would see. Um, oh, there's the pointer. In a whale watch around here, humpbacks are very whale watch friendly. And the last subfamily here, the blue fin, say, brutus, and minke whales are all very similar in shape, real sleek whales. And um, I have a few photos of some of these. These are just kind of a grab bag of photos that I put together <laughs> in kind of randomly. And most of them I didn't take myself. Most of them were taken by people in the lab here in Woods Hole, Bill Watkins, Karen Moore, and <clears throat> other people. So this is a right whale. It just shows a little bit the really long baleen in right whales. They, they have extremely long baleen plates, and they kind of swim through the water and filter out plankton. And that's another slide showing the baleen a little bit closer up in a right whale. That's a picture of a bowhead. It's not a great picture. It's the only one I had. And it just kind of shows a little bit just what a huge, bulbous body these guys have. They're real different in shape from the other 
um, balanopterid whales, which I'll get to next. And another thing about all baleen whales is that they have twin blowholes. So if you're ever trying to identify a whale in the wild and you don't know whether it's a baleen or a toothed whale, if, if you see a, a twin blowhole, that'll help you out. But of course, you probably won't have that problem because if it's big, it's probably a baleen whale or else it's a sperm whale, which I'll get to in a minute. Okay, and that's one of the fin whales, very sleek in shape, long. These guys occur out here too. And that's a closer up view of a fin whale. They have asymmetrical coloration on their jaw. Their right jaw is white and they have that twin blowhole. So they're pretty distinctive. And that's a minke whale, same shape as a fin whale, but shorter in length. And they've got those distinctive white patches on their flippers. And that's a closer up view of a minke showing the twin blowhole again and the white patches. There's a humpback breaching, one of the familiar sites for anybody who's been on a whale watch out here. A closer up view. That's an underwater shot that was taken by a National Geographic photographer, Flip Nicklet. And it just shows a humpback whale, mother with calf, and these guys have these very long, distinctive white flippers. They're pretty hard to mistake with anybody else, and they have flukes that have distinctive white patterns on them that people use to identify individuals. Okay, so now moving on to the Adana seats. I'll come back to the Mr. Seats in a second, but so this is, you know, I'm sure you'll be able to assimilate all of the information in this slide. <laughs> this is mostly just to give you a handle on how many more species there are of Adana seats than of Mr. Seats. There are a lot of species of Adana seats. There are most of the cetaceans, there are about 80% of the cetacean species. And so even though these guys are called toothed whales, a lot of the common names for the animals in this suborder are, are not whales. This includes the familiar groups, the phocenids, which are the porpoises, and the delphinids, which are the dolphins, which again are, is the group I'm gonna be talking about today in particular. And so porpoises and dolphins are, a, are different taxonomic groups. They, they, the terms shouldn't really be used interchangeably, although they are, and it's not really a big deal, but they do refer to different um, groups of animals. And they have different shaped teeth and different shaped heads. Okay. But of course, also this group includes the sperm whale, which is the largest seat, and it also includes the killer whale, the pilot whale, which is the species that strands the most around here, does all the mass strandings. By the way, if anybody has any questions, please just stop me at any time. I, I, I don't mind at all if you interrupt me, because I may leave out some glaring detail. Um, <laughs> this is a sperm whale. Again, I have the strange collection of pictures of seats that I just pulled out of places. But sperm whales are really weird looking. They look like a big barrel in the water. And they have an asymmetrical blowhole. They're blowholes on the left side of their head. So if you see them from a distance and you see that blow going off to the left, it's always pretty easy to tell that it's a sperm whale. And there's the familiar bottlenose, which I'll be coming back to. Um, that's a Stenella species, which is a smaller species of dolphin that is the, one, of the, one of the genera of um, dolphins that is affected by the tuna fishery, or, or was affected by the tuna fishery, still is to some extent. And that's just one of the smallest species of dolphins, Hector's dolphin, that's endemic to New Zealand. So these just happen to be the pictures <laughs> that I had. So. Um, anyway, so now this is getting into some of the um, information that I wanted to try to convey to you about comparisons between these different groups and how it relates to their communication, since that's what I'm supposed to be talking about. So starting with the baleen whales, I'll just kind of move through the information on this chart. And a lot of these are generalizations, and there are exceptions to some of the things written here, and there also may be some cases where there just isn't enough data and more data will perhaps disprove some of these things. But in general, baleen whales show very long annual migrations. I mean, these can be thousands of kilometers. And they show a feeding regime that is really tied to that annual cycle. They fast in the winter and they feast in the summer. 
and their breeding is highly seasonal. It's really constrained to the annual cycle. Their gestation period is about a year, so the babies are born at the same time of the year that they were conceived on the breeding grounds. And the growth rate in these animals is incredibly rapid. There are, there are published figures saying that um, calf blue whales gain an average of 80 kilograms a day, which is almost 200 pounds. So that's kind of phenomenal. And this is while they're nursing. So um, that's kind of an impossible to imagine demand on a mother blue whale. But they do, they do grow at astronomical rates. And, um, they wean very, very early. They wean at less than a year, so they stop nursing at less than a year. And at that point, they've reached a fairly good proportion of their adult size after only about a year or even less than a year. And then these last two categories I'm going to come back to in a minute. Let me just go through these on the toothed whale side. The adonisetes usually don't show those long annual migrations like the baleen whales. And similarly, they don't have any annual feeding cycles. Um, they don't have um, these highly seasonal breeding seasons. They do show seasonal peaks in birth, but they're not nearly as well defined as the adonisetes that are really tied into this yearly cycle. And in gestation, you know, which is just the period that it takes the young to develop inside the mother's womb is, um, can be as much as 15 to 16 months in sperm whales. So it tends to increase with size, whereas these guys are pretty much a year. And their growth rate is much, much slower than baleen whales. They, they, they take a, a lot longer time to grow. They have a much longer period of dependency on the mother. And so this number is updated continuously. I have to keep making up new versions of this slide because in the uh, project that I work on that I'm going to be telling you more about in Sarasota, Florida, they've just every year catch um, what well, we do a temporary capture project that I'll be talking about. And we've, so we're able to tell which females are lactating. And there is a female out there who has a seven-year-old calf right now who is still lactating. And the calf is still associating with her. And amazingly, there are indications that among sperm whales and pilot whales that nursing and lactation can go on even into the teen, teen years of some of those animals because they found lactose in the bellies of some animals those ages that were caught in whaling um, industries. And also, they found evidence that a lot of um, older females were still lactating even after they were done having calves. So, so there's really, really different things going on between these two groups. And so you might wonder, well, why are these guys nursing so long? I mean, they can take solid food way earlier than um, they can take solid food after about a year, if not sooner. And so this, this long, long period of dependency and slow growth period seems to have more to do with social learning than um, actual need for nourishment. And these toothed whales, this is where we start getting into the social interaction part, their, their groups tend to be characterized by very, very stable individual specific associations. And you know, there may just be a need for time to learn a lot of the aspects of, of their life in, in terms of you know, who is their kin and who are their associates and you know, how to feed and all of these things. There seems to be a long extended period of learning and the, the nursing can just be some kind of reinforcement of the mother-calf bond during that time. Whereas in the baleen whales, the social interactions on the whole are fairly brief. Um, they're mostly determined by the size of prey patches, you know, how much fish is out there. And there aren't a lot of really stable interactions uh, between specific individuals that have been noticed. Excuse me. Yes. Mm -hmm. Isn't the meaning of time and the gestation period, aren't they related one to one? Um, you mean the when breeding occurs? I, th so this is like the mating, the mating season is seasonal. Is that? But how often does, does the... How often does a, a female have a cat? An individual breed in, in relationship to the gestation period. 
Um, a female fin whale, for example, would probably have a calf every two years. So she would probably mate one season, have a calf the next year, nurse it, and then breed at the same time. I mean, I'm sorry, mate at the same time, and then the following year have another calf. So that's, that's kind of, um, that, it, could be more, it could be three years in a fin whale. In Adonis eats, it's much longer. It, we, we tend to have at least three years, if not more, in between calves with the bottlenose dolphins. You so welcome. you're welcome. I'm glad you asked. <laughs> OK, so are there any other questions about any of this? Yes? Uh, this may be a stupid question, but uh, uh, could, the diff could the difference in uh, uh, time it takes to uh, in the learning period uh, have to do with the difficulty in obtaining and catching food because that one they use different obviously they eat different things mm -hmm. that's a very interesting possibility I mean I don't think that you know that's not something there are really any data to say one way or another but it certainly could be related I mean that that you know that act of predation and mm -hmm. seeking out food um, and a lot of Adonis eats use echolocation which is something we don't really know how much learning is involved in that but it's it is very possible that more learning is involved so, so and, and with the need to migrate for longer distances also have to do with the differences in what they eat and how they catch their food as well and the need to process maybe large very large volumes of water mm -hmm. yeah i mean the, yeah i think so the nature of the, the growth cycles of the food they eat mm -hmm. where Mm -hmm. Yeah, because these animals, the baleen whales, are going to areas that are extremely rich food sources like Antarctic waters that are really full of krill and they really tank up and <laughs> so it's very, that's very possible, yeah. So, okay, yeah. How long do whales live and how many calves could they in that treat whales there in their lifetime? Yeah, that's a good question. Aging animals is, is a difficult thing. It's only been recently um, that people are starting to get those techniques down. We know that dolphins, bottlenose dolphins, can live to be about 50, possibly a little more. The females live longer than the males. And females, we do have a 45-year-old who had a calf. And so they can start having calves when they're as young as six. But they tend to lose calves that they have very early. So I think it would be unlikely for a female to have you know, more than, say, maybe eight successful offspring. I think that would be you know, pretty good for a do bottlenose dolphin. For baleen whales, um, you know, that's, that's a tough question. I've heard estimates of their age, age being you know, upwards around 60 years. And I don't know how well established those estimates are. 60 or even 70 years. And so, you know, and then you can just kind of back calculate maybe every couple of years they could have a calf starting at about five or six, and they tend to spread out a little more as the animal gets older. But so that's probably a pretty reasonable idea. Okay, so, is that it? <laughs> okay, yeah. Would a toothed a tooth whale ever have more than one calf to take care of? No, uh, that's never been observed, and at least within, do well, you know, there are very few of these species that have been observed very extensively in the wild, but with bottlenose dolphins, which are what I always come back to since that's what I know the most about, um, when, when a mother has a new calf, she, she generally kind of kicks out the dependent calf, and, um, we, and often it doesn't look like it's, it's very happy about that too. So, because we have a lot of older calves that are still sort of hanging around their moms after the mom has had a new baby. So, yeah. Do um, the babies seem to learn mostly from the female, from the mother, rather than from the father, since you said the close attachment? Yeah, yeah, you mean, well, social stuff, you know, there isn't really that much known about how they learn that. It's kind of a hi in the hypothesis stage, but in terms of learning vocalizations, that's something I'm going to be talking about, and that is the case. That they don't learn anything from their fathers because these guys don't even know who their fathers are, probably. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, that's the reality, I'm afraid. <laughs> so, yeah. They seem to be learning rather quickly, mm -hmm. but uh, in the wild, I gather that they don't learn 
learn as quickly as the things that they would learn in captivity? I don't know. I, don't, I can't see how you could really compare their learning rates, you know, because they're using operant conditioning techniques yeah. and stuff like that. And the feeding and so on, we saw that, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a, that would be a tough call. And it's very hard to quantify learning in the wild. <laughs> so um, it would be wonderful if it wasn't hard, but unfortunately it is. So anyway, but yeah, but I will be talking about learning of their vocalizations. So hopefully that will address some of that issue. So. Any multiple births? Um, I guess there have been a couple of cetaceans that have been found to have twin fetuses. If you guys know any more about this, please just correct me, okay? Because <laughs> life history stuff is not exactly my specialty, but I don't, I, I guess there was maybe one killer whale documented with a twin birth, but I think they're extremely rare. And they, I, as far as I know, they've never been documented in dolphins. So, <laughs> yeah, if there's anybody in the audience who knows more about this than me, please feel free to speak up. But I better move on to communication so that we get into an area that I know more about. <laughs> okay, so. All right, so I'll just, I will just move on here um, to this last category, which is what I'm going to now um, focus on a bit, since that's what the title of my talk is, and to just show you how the communication signals in baleen whales tend to be, uh, function as reproductive advertisement displays, as opposed to the toothed whales that tend to have individually distinctive signals, at least a few species that we know a lot about. And these are very different functions, and I'd like to try to get that across if I can. Um, the communication signals in baleen whales have been pretty well studied, especially one, a very celebrated one, which is the song of the humpback whale, which I wanted to sh tell you a little bit about and to actually play a little for you. And humpback whales sing while they're standing on their heads for some bizarre reason. And this, again, was a photograph that was taken by a National Geographic photographer. And they, it's pretty much only the males. Of course, there was one female that was observed singing because it could never be that perfect that it was all males. But um, in general, it is only males that sing, and they only sing on the breeding grounds. So already, those are kind of some indications that these are not you know, the types of communicative signals that we could even relate to as a, in terms of like our own language or something like that. This is, these are signals that are probably somewhat more analogous to like bird song, that when birds are setting up territories or attracting mates. Um, why don't I play a little bit for you? I have a, spe this is just a spectrogram, which is something I'm going to be showing some more of later. These are plots of frequency on the y-axis versus time on the x-axis, and this goes all the way to 120 seconds, and these are repeating sequences. Uh, well, I'm sorry, these are, you know, it goes all the way over to the right and then starts again on the left and goes all the way over. So you don't really have to, you know, look at this too much, but just to give you an idea of how complicated and how long the humpback whale song is. And let me just play a random segment for you and you can hear a little bit of it. This is the same thing that's on there. Everybody hear it? That's one of the repeating segments. They tend to do repeating segments and then move on to another phrase. And the whole song can last um, about 20 minutes. And then they can just go back and start the whole thing over again. Unfortunately, I picked kind of a repetitive segment of the tape. But um, oh, there we go. <laughs> Wow, that might be a good stopping point. <laughs> okay, but um, so these were very accessible when these were first described. For one thing, they are in the range of human voice. Human voice is in the same range here in the low, lower uh, couple of kilohertz, which is very different from dolphin sounds. And, and I, you know, people were just struck by how complex these songs are, and they are very complex. And they repeat and they change, which is something I'm going to talk about. And um, so people sort of started hypothesizing that this must be, you know, humpback whales, you know, passing down their family history from generation to generation and stuff. But um, as it turned out, when people started studying it a little more closely, and a lot of this was work done by Peter Tayak, who's here at the Oceanographic, um, back when he was in graduate school. And what, what's happening with humpback song is that the song is gradually changing over time. So starting at the beginning of the breeding season in January, 
the whales may be producing, you know, this version, this is just one sample phrase. And that phrase is going to undergo gradual changes and end up maybe something more like this at the end of the breeding season. So this might be for one whale, but it actually turns out that every whale in the breeding ground matches these changes. So here's one identified singer, whale C, because they were actually able to get in the water and identify it by photographing its tail flukes. And whale C was producing this version of a phrase in 1979, this version in 1980, and then just random unidentified singers that are recorded in the same area were doing the same thing. So basically, these guys are matching one another. They're producing very complex songs, but they're all producing the same thing. And nobody really knows what whales are initiating the changes. That would be a really interesting thing to look at. But in general, you know, these signals do not seem like they're conveying a lot of information because there's a lot of males out there that are all just sort of striving to produce the same song. And it changes from year to year in a somewhat random seeming fashion. And so what a lot of people who study humpback song have, have concluded is that humpback song probably functions, as I was saying, as some kind of reproductive advertisement display. This slide just sh says male sedge warblers with the largest song repertoires are the first to acquire mates in the spring. So this is just a comparison to show you that large song repertoires in these particular birds is something that's correlated with their mating success. And so a lot of people are thinking that humpback whales on the breeding ground, um, female humpback whales on the breeding ground are somehow assessing their potential mates according to the song that they're producing. And, and all the males are sort of trying to match one another in, um, in this kind of bizarre display. So it's an acoustic display, but in a way it could be likened to something, a trait sort of like a peacock's tail, which is something that's been selected for by a process called sexual selection, which is, it's a trait that seems useless, but it is something that females tend to like for some reason. And, um, and so the, this is something that Darwin had a lot of trouble getting a handle on, but there are traits like that out there that seem to be subject to sexual selection rather than natural selection. But in any case, I probably don't really have time to get too much into that topic, but that's the main idea is that these are signals that are functioning for the purpose of allowing females to assess mates or maybe to allow males to compete with one another. In any case, they're functioning as some kind of reproductive advertisement, not so much communication in, of, in terms of conveying information about things, you know, saying, hey, there's fish over there, or I'm Frank, you know, I'm hungry or something. These songs probably don't mean things like that. Yes. Well, except for that one, um, in terms of song, yeah, but they do produce other, they produce so-called social sounds, you know, sort of grunts and things like that, but not too much known about those. Okay. Um, okay, and so now here's a, a slide just showing seasonal variation in finback bouts. This is not, I'm not going to go into too much detail about this, but it, the main point that I just wanted to get across from this slide is just that finback whales also produce seasonal sounds seasonally. So there's a seasonal peak in the number of sounds that finback whales are producing because they had hydrophones set up year round in a certain area. And so the fact that there's a seasonal peak really argues that these these also have some kind of reproductive function. If these were communicative signals, you know, again, functioning in the way I was saying, like there's fish over here, be careful, there's a shark over there, or something, um, you wouldn't think they'd have a seasonal peak necessarily if the animals are all in the area, you know, throughout the time period. Um, Okay, so now I'm going to switch gears and talk a little bit about adonocetes. And I'm really only going to talk about two types of adonocetes, and very briefly, this one, the sperm whale. This is another picture taken by Flip Nicklin um, from National Geographic. And this actually is a photograph of a sperm whale underwater. So they're pretty amazing looking creatures. They're bizarre looking creatures. And sperm whales have very, very stable individually specific associations. That much is known about them. The same animals are sighted together year after year after year after year. And especially the female groups. And the males tend to have longer migrations. And um, again, there's, you know, it's a little bit more complex than I need to go into right now. But the main idea 
is that they do have individually specific social relationships that seem pretty stable. And they have sounds that sort of match that need. They produce these individually distinctive sequences of clicks that are called codas. And these, I didn't bring a tape of these, but I mean, they really just sort of sound like that. You know, something like a, or in a distinctive pattern, and each animal would have its own distinctive pattern of clicks. And these, although not that much is known about their functions at this time, it seems very likely that these function as some sort of individual recognition, so that whales are able to identify one another as individuals. And so this again, oh yeah. Will the females make those clicks? Yes, yes. It's, I, there's no evidence that this is, that uh, only males produce these. It seems like all whales produce them. It's a good question, though. And um, you know, so again, just to get, you know, um, kind of put this in perspective, when I was talking about the baleen whales, I mentioned that their social relationships tend to be pretty brief. They tend to be just sort of feeding aggregations, etc. And so they perhaps don't really have a need to know one another as individuals. And they don't seem to show that much evidence that they do recognize a lot of other individuals and you know, maintain strong bonds with other individuals, whereas the sperm whales really do. And so it kind of makes sense that they would have vocalizations that would allow them to keep track of individuals. OK, so now I'll move on to talking about the bottlenose dolphin, which is, again, so this is moving into a little more comfortable territory for me, because this is the only species that I've actually studied. Um, and these guys are the most familiar species of dolphin. This is the kind that's held in most ocean area, like SeaWorld. They're pretty hardy animals. And I want to talk in a fair bit of detail about their communication. But before I get started on you know, just talking about their specific types of vocalizations, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about the history of the study of dolphin communication, because it's something that those of us who are in the field are something we kind of have to, to deal with, that, that it has a history and that it has tended to be a fairly sensational field. So first of all, a man named John Lilly back in the 60s and 70s wrote a series of books. This is one of the titles, The Mind of the Dolphin. And here he suggested that dolphins are a key to understanding alien intelligence. So these were very widely read. And this is kind of what set the stage. This is sort of what got people thinking about dolphins and, and probably why there was Flipper and all those other things. Because um, he really popularized this idea. And he, he, he became really interested in dolphins because they do have very large brains. Bottlenose dolphins do have the largest brains in the animal world in, in relation to their body, ra body weight. Um, so that, that is a, a very interesting thing. <laughs> There's no question about that. But of course, it doesn't necessarily mean that they have a language like ours. But he did think that it meant that. And dolphins do ha produce a wide variety of sounds. I mean, they produce a very rich vocal repertoire. These, again, are spectrograms, plots of frequency versus time. This is frequency on the y-axis, time on the x-axis. So whistles, uh, this is just one class of sounds that dolphins produce called whistles. And so they're just distinctive. Um, patterns of frequency changes over time. They, go, they can easily go up to 20 kilohertz, if not higher. And our hearing cuts off at 16, if not lower. And as, as we get older, our high frequency hearing cuts off even lower. And our voices, again, are down around here. But uh, so whistles is the, are, are the topic that I'm going to talk about most. But they do also have two other sort of classes of vocalizations. Echolocation, which is used as a form of sonar, which is sort of how they visualize their environment. They use very um, loud and um, broadband clicks that have a lot of different frequencies in them to kind of image their environment. It's very, very accurate. And then they also have another type of sound that's called burst pulse sounds. This is basically a garbage can category of sounds that nothing is known about. And it, they're so complicated that nobody can really deal with them. It's not that they're really that complicated. They're just kind of overwhelming. When you come across a group of animals making burst pulse sounds, it sounds like you've hit upon a barnyard you know, that has just exploded or something. I mean, it's just these animals make the most bizarre sounds. And do you have a question? 
Yes, it does, exactly. That's exactly what it does, is when they make a click, it bounces off of something, and then the echo comes back to them, and that's how they're able to tell what that object is. So they can tell if it's a fish or a rock or another dolphin or something. So that's exactly right. Um, I'm going to play a tape that has some whistles and some clicks on it. So you get to hear some of these. And it doesn't, I don't think it really has any burst pulse sounds on it. But um, let's see what it has. Probably has one. Well, that's a weird noise. The kind of creaky door sounds are clicks. There's a whistle. I don't really remember what else is on this. I kind of randomly chose a spot. That's the hydrophone <laughs> moving around, which means it wasn't a very good section. It's another whistle. Another whistle. Those are also people's voices. That's a nice whistle. I think that gives you a little bit of a feel for them. Not that many clicks on this tape. Those are clicks in the background, but you probably can't hear them. So, anyway, uh, you know, just to give you a little bit of feeling, these are really fast, really high. You can't really identify them by ear very well. So you really have to look at them visually in this form to be able to you know, um, do much work with them. But anyway, so back to John Lilly. He w you know, worked with these animals and did record their sounds and, and you know, was very fascinated by their large brain and, and really came to the conclusion that they must have some kind of language that is analogous to ours. So he started by the premise that different whistle contours or different whistle shapes have different meanings. So for example, this particular whistle might mean fish, this one might mean shark, this one might mean help me. You know, in other words, these might be like words in a language. This is what he assumed was going on because they would go and put a hydrophone in the water with a group of dolphins. They'd get a whole bunch of different contours and they would just assume that every dolphin was producing every one and that it was just some kind of complicated language. But, um, you know, and this was sort of what dominated the field of do dolphin communication for quite a while, until a husband-wife team named David and Melba Caldwell started recording dolphins in captivity that were actually isolated. So individual dolphins, they could tell which animal was vocalizing because this is something I didn't mention, but that's the biggest problem in studying dolphin communication is that you cannot tell which animal is vocalizing. They don't make any external movement. They don't open their mouth. They don't do anything nice like that. That helps you to identify which animal is vocalizing. So, um, so if you have a group of animals and you put, you're recording their sounds, all you can say is all of these sounds were produced by all of these animals and you have no idea which animal is producing which. So that's why it kind of led to these types of hypotheses. But when the Caldwells started recording isolated individuals, what they found out was that actually dolphins were producing individually distinctive sounds, which shouldn't be a surprise since I led into this by basically telling you that they did and showing you that sperm whales did too. And um, so the Caldwells found that rather convincingly, in fact, that dolphins tended to produce a large number of these individually distinctive whistles that comprised about 90% of their vocal re vo whistle repertoire. Here's just another couple examples of signature whistles. You know, they're pretty distinctive, different individuals. You can just look at them and tell whose signature whistle it is once you get used to the different animals. But the work of the Caldwells pretty much lay in um, complete dormancy <laughs> for quite a while because I think in general people were not really that interested in their findings. I mean, it was much more exciting to believe John Lilly and think that these guys had an outrageously complicated language than to think that they were just going around saying, I'm Bob, I'm Bob, I'm Bob, I'm Bob, I'm Bob. Or, you know, that, that really was not very appealing to most people. So, so that, there were kind of just sat, you know, under, under covers for a long, long time and pretty much went ignored from, they discovered signature whistles in 1965. And it really wasn't until about 20 years later when um, Peter Tyak here at Woods Hole Oceanographic kind of picked up where they left off. But before I talk to you about his work, I just wanted to mention one other experiment which I think was 
somewhat involved. Um, it wasn't on signature whistles, but it was some work that I think influenced Peter in the direction of his own research. This was some work done with captive dolphins by a guy named Richards, Douglas Richards, who trained dolphins in captivity to imitate computer-generated sounds. So he would produce a computer model and then train the dolphins to imitate that model. And the dolphins were pretty good at it. They were better at some than others. And, and then he was able to also get the dolphins to associate a particular object with a whistle. So, you know, he would, every time he played this computer sound, he would hold up a frisbee or something. And then eventually, the dolphins would come to link the frisbee with that whistle and they would produce it spontaneously. Although the training of that took a while because they first started by decreasing the volume of the sounds, you know, more and more they'd get quieter and quieter so that the dolphins would just see the object and not the associated sound. But the dolphins just started producing the sounds quieter and quieter and quieter themselves. So, so that kind of backfired. <laughs> but it certainly showed how adept these animals are at mimicking sounds. And so, so that was a, a really neat finding because actually vocal mimicry is not very common in the animal kingdom at all, which I'll um, be talking about more in a minute. But in any case, um, Peter then sort of picked up with the Caldwell's work and, and after Douglas Richards' findings on mimicry, what he did is he developed a little device called a vocal light that the dolphins were trained to wear on their heads. Um, and they were pretty good about it. They, you know, were, were, were pretty accommodating. But, and so these things would light up when a dolphin would make a sound so people could stand around the tank and yell out red, yellow, green, or whatever, and, and be able to identify which dolphin was whistling, which again is the biggest problem in, in studying dolphins. And with that study, he found, interestingly, not only that each animal produced its own signature whistle, but that the next most common whistle that the, the animals produced was an imitation. In this case, these were two animals held together. The next most common whistle was an imitation of their tank mate's whistle. So in this case, Scotty and Spray, this is Scotty's signature, and he produced all sorts of different little versions of it. And Spray would do these kind of OK imitations of it, but they were pretty obviously imitations of Scotty's whistle. And Spray, on the other hand, um, had this somewhat simpler whistle, although there is a feature to it that you probably can't even really see, but there's a little break in frequency right here that Scotty even imitated very, very accurately. So that was kind of neat. And Scotty was a really excellent mimic. He was better at it than Spray was. But in any case, um, these guys were producing their own signature whistles, and they were also imitating one another's whistles. And that, again, was something that could not have been discovered without these devices that Peter designed to put on the heads of these animals. Um, you know, because otherwise you would have just gotten two different whistle types and assumed that, you know, maybe you would have assumed that each one was producing their own or you might have thought that they meant, you know, help me or something. But um, that really started to build on the Caldwell's findings quite a bit. Okay. Um, I remember, yeah, so I think I'll just move on now and talk a little bit about the work that I've been doing, which is with free-ranging dolphins. I was very lucky to have the opportunity to start working in, when I started here in 1986 with, but with Peter Tyack and, and also with Randy Wells, um, Michael Scott, Blair Irvine, and Andy Reed, who's another person who's here at the Oceanographic, who are in, running a project down in Sarasota, Florida, and, which has been ongoing since 1970. And the animals down there, there's a resident community of about 100 bottlenose dolphins living in inshore waters that are all very identifiable by their dorsal fins. So this is just an example of how you can, I mean, once you get to learn these animals, their, their fins just look like faces. You know, they pop out of the water and you see these distinctive patterns of notches or something like this, very dramatic. But um, their shape, fin shape and notch patterns are very distinctive. So you can identify individuals. This is just an overhead view of this field site. So a lot of these, this is the Gulf of Mexico out here, and these are some inshore waters. This is actually where I do most of my work in Palmasola Bay, which is where um, most of the moms and calves hang out. And um, so it's nice protected waters and lots of fish, and it's just a great place to work. <laughs> Um, but part of the project is this temporary capture and release program that I just wanted to tell you a little bit about before I tell you also a little bit about my own work, and then I'll um, 
wrap things up, but there, there is this temporary capture and release program that is run through Earthwatch that if anybody wants more information about I can give you after. And so we have a small army of people that come down and um, we encircle the dolphins in a net in shallow water and then bring them on board a boat, weigh them. This is Andy Reid right here, who's here at the Oceanographic, and put them in a raft or on a boat or something, and basically measure everything that you could possibly measure on a dolphin. <laughs> so fins, um, shark bite scars, which are quite common on a lot of the animals. About a quarter of the animals have ver visible shark bite scars. It could even be more than that now. Um, and they are freeze branded. The freeze brands are, are done in a place that is without nerve endings. It's the same um, technique used for cattle. They don't seem to respond to it at all. And this is a very useful method. So when animals strand, for example, on the beach, if somebody else finds them other than Randy or one of the few people who knows these animals, they can report to him, you know, that's freeze brand 59 or something. But um, we can't really see freeze brands from the boat usually. They, they, disappear too quickly. You can only see them if you look really close at the animals. Excuse me. Yeah. Um, is it true in captivity that the dorsal fins are whales, they, um, they curve when they don't have enough room? Uh, I've, I don't know, to tell you the truth. I've never, on whales or dolphins, or both? <laughs> But um, uh, dolphins, I've never observed that in. I guess uh, killer whales, I have seen a couple that have cur curved fins, and I don't know what that's due to. And th that would really be the only whale species that's held in captivity. So I can't really, can't really answer that, I'm afraid. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, OK, so this is just showing that we have a veterinarian along who takes blood samples. And he, um, we do, they do genetic analyses like DNA fingerprinting to try to figure out who the fathers of the calves are. And this is something kind of briefly mentioned before. But these animals are, are not monogamous by any stretch of the imagination. So I mean, that's one of the um, misconceptions about whales and dolphins is you, know, they, you always see those pictures of a mother whale and a father whale and a baby and stuff. But, that's not, real, that's not reality, unfortunately. So um, these, these guys are highly po polygamous, I guess you should say, because it's not really known. Their mating system is not really that well known. But there doesn't seem to be any consistent associations between adult males and calves. So we don't know if the calves even know who their fathers are or vice versa. But some of this will be used to figure that out. And also, the blood is used to look for contaminant levels and things like that, which are going to be really useful with a lot of these die-offs that are happening. And one final thing that um, is done during the captures is a tooth is taken. These guys have 90 teeth. And we've had perfectly healthy animals um, appear. We've caught perfectly healthy animals that have six teeth left in their mouth. And they just use them for grasping prey. They don't use them for chewing. So taking one doesn't seem to have any effect. And it also allows us to really accurately determine the age of the animals. And a woman named Alita Hone has really perfected that technique in Sarasota because she was able to start with known aged animals, because Randy Wells had observed the animals for so long and knew when animals were born. So he could give teeth to Alita. She would age them blind and, he would, and say, well, I think it's three and something. And then he could look in his records and say, yeah, it is three and something. Whereas before that, nobody ever really knew if they were doing it correctly. I mean, the idea here is that they, they do lay down annual layers in their teeth for some unknown reason. But um, nobody was ever really sure where the annual layers were until this project. And so again, we do know now that we had a 52-year-old who unfortunately just died this year. And um, the oldest male was 42. So those are pretty much the maximum ages known for bottlenose dolphins, as far as I know. And then the part of the project that I'm involved in is recording these animals with suction cup hydrophones. These were designed by Peter Tyak. And these just stick right on the head of the animal and record vocalizations throughout the entire capture process so that we can get whistles from known individuals, which again is, is the big problem. You can't identify who's vocalizing. But during the captures, we get these great recordings of known individuals. 
But you may wonder, are these normal whistles that these guys are producing? Are they just going, help me, help me, help me? But it doesn't seem like that's the case. They are producing their signature whistles during temporary capture. And I've confirmed that through a number of observations. These are just a few examples of whistles recorded during temporary capture from two different females, and then just when I was following them in a boat during behavioral observations. And I would get the same contours, the same patterns of frequency changes over time in those two different contexts. So I just wanted to mention briefly now um, some of the results that I've gotten, which in which started out using capture recordings and just comparing whistles of mothers and, all, and calves. That was one of the first things I started out doing. And well, first off, let me just point out that the signature whistles are very, very stable. So over a period of 11 years shown in this slide, these are some tapes that somebody gave us. I haven't been here that long, but somebody gave us those um, who w recorded in 1976, which was great. And we could see that the whistles are very, very stable over long, long periods. But the other thing that really jumped out at me when I first started looking at these tapes was that the female calves tended to produce whistles that were very different from their mothers. And I just have a few examples of these in the next few slides. Here's a mother, again, with a female calf. There's really no similarity in whistle structure between the female calves and their mothers. There's another, oh, okay. So here's an example of a mother. This is the same mother on the left side, recorded from 75 to 89. And on the right side are four different calves. These three are males, and this one is a female. And her three male calves all produced whistles that were pretty similar to hers in, in you know, just that they're these sort of simple frequency up sweeps. Whereas the female calf produced a whistle with a very different type of structure, uh, this a kind of loop structure, yeah. How do you select a phrase that you choose to put on the view graph? Well, they're pretty um, stereotyped. They just kind of produce this over and over and over and over and over again. And, and she does it in sets of three. That's so, the predominant. Yeah, that's the predominant contour. It's usually pretty easy to figure that out. They do produce other whistles, but they, you know, usually, and, and well, I would say during temporary capture, this signature contour is probably, you know, a good 80%, but, you know, it varies across different ages and sexes, um, but it's a lot, they produce it a lot. So it's usually pretty easy to pinpoint. So anyway, so the males tended to be somewhat similar. I thought the females different, but I just decided that maybe people wouldn't take my word for this. So I asked a whole bunch of people to compare whistles. I basically asked completely naive judges to look at these whistles and, and t you know, without knowing who was whose mother and who was whose calf and, and decide which ones look similar and which ones look different. This is a very difficult thing to, qu to quantify using a computer, which is something I can talk to anybody about afterwards if you're interested, but that's the reason why we ask people to do it, because people are very good at looking at shapes and deciding whether they're similar or different. Right now, it's, there are, have been a couple of MIT students working on that problem to try to computerize that, but it's a very difficult issue. But in any case, what came out of this judge's study, this, they rated whistles on a scale from one to five, one being not similar, five being similar, and I lumped, I then divided their scores into three categories, not similar, somewhat similar, very similar. And it turned out that there was a significant difference between the numbers of males and females that produced whistles not similar and very similar to the mother. The, the left-hand bars are the males, the right hands are the females. So the majority of females produced whistles not similar, and more males than females produced whistles very similar. But still, not all the males, not even half, actually. Um, and this is just one final example showing uh, an example of a mother and a male calf whistles that were rated five that gave the highest rating by the judges, and then whistles of a mother and female calf that were rated very low, one, as being very different. Okay, and so I'm going to wrap this up in a minute or so, but I just wanted to comment on possible reasons why this sex difference might exist. And this is something we can only speculate about, but one idea is that since adult females in Sarasota tend to remain in their matrilineal groups, 
And so in other words, you know, mothers and daughters and aunts and sisters all hang out together in Sarasota. And since signature whistles are used as a contact call between mothers and calves, it could be very important for females to produce whistles that are very different from their mothers, because otherwise you'd have all these females in a group producing similar whistles, and a calf might have no idea which one its mother was if they all sounded the same. So this could be a reason why females tend to develop whistles that are very different from their moms. And adult males tend to disperse in the community, and right now, you know, it, it could just be that sort of things are more open for males. Some of them develop whistles like their moms, some don't, you know, and it may not really matter that much for males. But this is, this is all highly speculative, of course, since we can never prove or disprove any of the things that I'm saying. But um, I, so, the, so the why of the sex difference is a very difficult thing to prove. The how of the sex difference is actually the focus of my research right now, looking at, looking at what processes um, might contribute to this, this sex difference. And I'm going to skip over some of the next bit of data that I have, because I, I don't want to go too late. But, um, but I just wanted to point out that, you know, given the very, very close association that exists between a mother and a young calf in the wild, I've speculated that perhaps the mother may exert some control over whether or not her calf develops a whistle like her or not. You know, that perhaps the mother can regulate what other individuals the calf associates with, what other whistles it hears. And so these are the types of things that I'm actually addressing in my own research right now, which I've started to address, but I'm going to continue in the next couple of summers in Sarasota, is, is how does the sex difference come about? So, um, okay, and this is just showing our setup in the boat with, uh, you know, what we follow the animals for as long as we possibly can and record their whistles and do behavioral observations at the same time. And with three experts on board, we rarely have any disagreement as to where the focal animal is. So, <laughs> anyway, so, all right. Um, okay, so I guess now, you know, I'll just end with this by saying that we should go beyond studies of signature whistles and try to learn really how these animals are communicating with one another. And so it looks like, you know, <laughs> this will be the next step, perhaps, that we'll find out that they're really speaking Spanish to us or something. But, all right. But actually, that's, I think, all I have to say. So I'd be happy to answer questions. But if anybody wants to leave, <laughs> feel free. Okay. Okay. Yeah, Tim. Oh, that's a good question. That's one of the things that I was going to talk about, but I didn't think I had time. But that it's very variable. And so that's one of the things. It can be in captivity. It's been seen to develop the whistle within a few days, although then it kind of gets a little more crystallized with time. I had one calf in Sarasota that took over a year. And I'm not sure if it was, it was sometime between 13 and 24 months. And um, then I had others that were three months, one that was four. You know, so it's just kind of across the board. And that's one of the things that I want to look at. It's not only, not only what influences what whistle the calf develops, like whether it's like mom or like somebody else, but also what influences how long it takes. Because it's so different. And I'd like to know why. <laughs> so I'm glad you asked that. Yeah. If you take one object and you try to teach two or three different dolphins, respond to that object, what type of uh, frequency response do you get to reach the three of them? The same or the totally independent? I'm not sure I understand. Do you mean... Okay, you, you said that uh, you could teach the dolphin to recognize, for example, a, a to, frisbee. To associate a whistle with a, an object. So if you have, mm -hmm. say, what's two different dolphins, mm -hmm. you lose the frisbee, you mm -hmm. get two totally independent sounds. No. No, what they did is that they trained a particular sound to be associated with the Frisbee. So what they did is that they would play a sound, show the Frisbee, and they would try to get the animal to associate that particular sound with the Frisbee. And so initially, the, what I was telling you about is that to get them, the, so then their ultimate goal was to be able to hold up the Frisbee and have the animal produce that whistle. So the way they first started out to do it was by fading out the sounds, which is what I was telling you to do, so that they would play it quieter and quieter and quieter, and then the animal kept imitating that. And so eventually they changed their paradigm, and they just would play it sporadically. And eventually the animal got to the point where when you showed it the Frisbee, it would produce that very exact same sound that it was trained to do. It's totally independent from animal 
Um, well, they trained the same sound for two different animals, I believe, in that particular study. There were only two animals in the tank, and they trained them both to produce the same sounds to be associated with frisbee, I think, or ball or, you know, whatever else. So. Mm -hmm. That sound's never been trained intergenerational to the next. I don't think, that's not been looked at. Those particular animals have not had any offspring. The ones that have been subjected to some really intensive training out in Hawaii. And um, so they've never had any offspring and, and I don't know of any instances of, um, you know, animals that have been trained sounds that have had offspring and, you know, that's been studied. So a lot of these questions are very much, you know, in their infancy, I would say, because that would be an interesting thing to look at. Mm-hmm. Beluga whale has a very complicated sound system. Has anybody Well, actually, a woman who was in our lab did her thesis on beluga whales. She just moved to um, Toronto. She's working for World Wildlife Fund, but she was one of the only people who did. There have been very few studies on the beluga repertoire, and there's a very good reason for it. It's impossible to study. It's really complicated. And she basically kind of came up with some really interesting conclusions, which were sort of that there were no classes of sounds, that they were all sort of graded together except for very few, and basically they're really intractable. <laughs> so it was, it was a tough, um, they're a tough animal to study vocalizations in. They're very vocal and they have a real wide variety of sounds. So, <laughs> yeah. Do you have data on these impulse births? The birth pulse sounds? Yeah. No. I, I, uh, I decided that I would be in graduate school for 25 years if I tried to deal with birth pulse sounds. I think that they were in my original thesis proposal and everyone canned them because they said I would never get done. So unfortunately, that's what's happening to everybody in birth pulse sounds is that they're just too overwhelming. And so there really is n virtually no data on them. Could they be a large conglomerate of clicks? Um, there, some of them could be, some of them could be, but some of them are different in quality than clicks. There's really a huge variety in those sounds. So, you know, kind of, if, if uh, I would say that would be a good project for somebody <laughs> who wants to tackle. <laughs> it has a lot of money, yeah. Have they ever tried to train corpuses? To the extent where they do the dolphins? Oh, well, porpoises are really hard to hold in captivity. They haven't had much success with that. Porpoises are kind of spooky. And in fact, almost all other species of dolphin other than the bottlenose are real spooky. And so a lot of har some harbor porpoise, for example, you know, if you just pick them up, they might even have a heart attack or something. And so, I mean, that doesn't, you know, always happen, but it, it can happen. And the same thing with spinner dolphins, the kind that are impacted by the tuna nets. They're very... Um, I, you know, I don't really know how else to put it, except that you know, they're just kind of more temperamental. They're not as hardy as these guys. So, so I don't, I'm not aware of any experiments with training porpoises. Are you? Do you know of any? The helium experiment? Well, yeah, the helium stuff. Yeah, that was the only thing. So it wasn't really training them, but just looking at how their vocalizations vary in a helium atmosphere. So that's a little bit different, but not these, you know, not training sounds and stuff. Porpoises don't even produce whistles, actually. So they're a little bit harder to study. Yeah. Do, the, uh, do they make these different sounds in different ways, like humans, you know, whistles and low sounds? And how do they make the sounds? Yeah. I knew somebody was going to ask that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, that's okay. Well, there, yeah, the sound production is kind of controversial, but it, it is known that um, the sounds are produced in this region called the nasal sacs right under the, do the uh, blowhole. And so it's, they seem to be just sort of um, in, what's going on is there's air being exchanged between these nasal sacs and um, that's the basic mechanism for sound production and they're sealed by these very muscular nasal plugs and, and air doesn't have to be released for sounds to be produced and they do believe that um, both clicks and whistles are produced in that same region. Some people think that maybe it's the left side that produces clicks and the right side that produces whistle, but I don't think there's really any data supporting that, at least not to my knowledge, and I haven't really read up on it recently. It's a difficult thing to study because you can't do invasive research on dolphins in the United States, so you can't like really go in there and try to see how their sounds are being produced like you can with some other species. And so there's still a controversy. Some people still think that other parts of their um, anatomy are involved in sound production. So it's, yeah. Mm -hmm. Are you doing any work with generating these signature whistles? and Playing them back? Yeah. 
Yeah, I am actually. That was something I didn't um, have time to talk about. But yeah, I did do some playback experiments. I was looking at whether they could recognize one another's signature whistles. I mean, I started at a pretty fundamental level and uh, found you know, got some pretty strong results. But they were very time intensive, these experiments. They were really hard to conduct. But, um, but we did get some very conclusive evidence that they can recognize one another's signature whistles. And, and so there's a lot of potential with playback experiments. That's going to be a good tool. Yeah? Is there any response in the communication of these animals to sudden events of coastal pollution? In the communication? I, I don't think that that has been studied. I mean, basically, the only, there are only two populations of dolphins in existence, I would say, that their, their communication is being studied. And that is in Sarasota and in um, Australia. And so you know, we just don't have that kind of data, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Yes? You know, the opposite is, has that been studied on their hearing? Yes, there has been work done on their hearing sensitivities. And uh, that's been done in captivity. They've done, you know, all audiograms of these guys and seen, you know, what their peak sensitivities of hearing is. And so that work has been carried out pretty extensively. Yeah. Might that show that other communication is going on at the same time in different Well, they definitely do produce clicks and whistles at the same time. We know that much. Um, you know, but as for what any of these, how any of these sounds function beyond signature whistles for individual identification and um, clicks for, you know, <coughs> visualizing their environment, we just don't know how these sounds are functioning. But I could say that they do produce more than, they can produce more than one sound at a time. Mm -hmm. Is the uh, frequency range capability of the equipment you're using? Um, the VCR that I record goes up with goes up to about 32 kilo. Well, it goes up higher than 32 kilohertz, but the analysis equipment that I use goes up to 32 kilohertz. And there's only been two whistles in my experience that have gone off the off the um, the screen. Of course, we're missing some harmonics, but I haven't really done much with harmonics at this point anyway. And um, so it seems to be capturing most of it. The clicks are go much much higher frequency, but I, I haven't been working with those. Need much more sophisticated equipment to work with those. So, any other questions? <laughs> okay. okay thanks.